You guys may be seated. What is Faith Promise? Faith Promise is a way for the local church to be able to fund reaching the world with this great gospel. Faith Promise is an agreement that, as God provides, the donor will give a specific amount on a regular basis to the missionary offering of the local church. Faith Promise funds remain in the church locally and are dispersed by the church to fund their missions program as needed. Faith Promise Giving incorporates the dynamics of faith, love, commitment, consistency, and the sure promises of God. Faith Promise works. It is a promise to give a financial gift for global outreach based on faith. The Faith Promise commitment is motivated and compelled by faith, trusting that God will allow you the means to give and serve needs around the world for His glory. It's a commitment of a certain amount of money God puts on your heart as those funds become available. The faith in Faith Promise is my trusting God to enable me to give more than I thought I could give while still meeting all of my own stewardship commitments. It's the abundance, the money that I have after everything is paid off. The promise is my trusting God because He promised to supply all my needs. Faith promise is a biblical principle. Faith promise follows a scriptural plan of giving based on the apostolic method in 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Faith promise works because it is a purely biblical basis of giving, by faith. It is not what we give in stewardship such as tithes and offerings. It is not sacrificial giving that happens in times of great need or compassion. It is the act of faith in believing God for what is not seen and allowing Him to make it into substance and evidence. The Apostle Paul wrote, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. 2 Corinthians 8.3 mentions giving beyond their power. The heart of faith promise giving requires the exercising of faith for fulfillment of the promise. Trusting God's plan and promise opens the doors of blessing into every life. This is more than a financial fundraising tool. It is actually a tremendous spiritual experience that blesses and brings blessing from God's perfect provision. Put your trust in God by getting involved in faith promise today. Luke 6.38 Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, running over shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured unto you again. So how does someone make a faith promise commitment? Prayer is the most important step in any decision making. In anything in life you commit to, you have to stick with it, realizing that your faith will grow as you stay committed to the promise. Look for unexpected ways God provides maybe an unexpected raise or inheritance. Have faith. Give as God enables you to give. Many of our churches have countless stories of times where someone who made a faith promise and didn't know where it would come from, but then God worked a miracle for His glory. Remember faith promise is the above and beyond giving. Faith promise does not replace your tithe or offerings. It is a promise between you and God. Faith Promise needs your faithfulness to give as God enables you. You have a Faith Promise card and anyone can fill it out. Parents, teens, and even kids can make a Faith Promise. Faith compels us to give everything for the spread of this gospel. As our act of worship, we choose to be used up for His glory. Thank you for being a part of Faith Promise and Global Missions. It works. Uh, 
not working superbly today. Well, it is good to be in God's house, though, even when technology doesn't work. So we're going to be uh, we're going to be picking up where we left off last week. Hopefully, you had an opportunity to tune in and uh, catch up a little bit on uh, the services last week, even though we weren't able to meet in person. Uh, it's interesting. We started off uh, in our, our series, which is entitled uh, Essential Elements. And uh, in that series, uh, we, we've been looking at the things that, as a church, we're really responsible for doing. We looked at uh, membership or fellowship, about what it looks like to belong, and uh, how we uh, enact that. And uh, then we spent some time looking at maturity or discipleship and the responsibility that we have to grow in God, the things that our church does to provide opportunity for that. And then uh, Cameron uh, spoke about uh, ministry and about how God has equipped and uh, has gifted each of us for ministry. And then we've actually spent the last uh, two weeks on uh, mission, which is uh, evangelism, outreach. It's our great commission uh, commandment that God has given us. And uh, with regard to uh, essential elements, uh, this winds up being one that really defines for us, if you will, uh, the, the mission or purpose that God has given us as a church. And uh, one of the ways that we have uh, historically enacted that uh, and uh, really funded that for our church's ministries has been through Faith Promise. And I spent some time talking about that last week. Uh, hopefully, as uh, you were uh, listening to that, uh, it was a refresher for you if you participated in Faith Promise with us. And uh, if it, you haven't participated, hopefully it was enough to uh, help you to understand exactly uh, what it is that Faith Promise consists of. I think the video that uh, you just got through watching gives a, pr a pretty succinct and concise explanation of what exactly that would look like. Uh, Faith Promise giving, as I shared with you, and this was almost uh, the last part of last week, was uh, really uh, a commitment to pray, uh, to uh, ask God to provide what was uh, really not uh, we're not able to do, and then uh, to commit beyond that uh, and look at, um, uh, you know, what, what it is that God has uh, laid upon our heart to give and uh, to follow through on that by watching uh, as God would provide in that, and then uh, in watching, you know, following through on the commitment we've made in giving and uh, what God has provided to us, or th excuse me, through us, that he might not give to us. And you know, as you look at that sequence of things, uh, it's presented as a sequence, but in all honesty, there's a continuance. And uh, it's kind of uh, illustrated by the fact that uh, even though we, we pray before uh, and uh, we make a commitment and uh, we begin to watch and then we give, uh, there's uh, involved in that the continuance of each of those elements. And actually today, uh, I told you that we were starting with, uh, uh, we started in our uh, an emphasis on mission with a widow, and it was the widow that uh, was pretty prominent in Elisha's ministry. Uh, she was the one who was a widow of a prophet, if you remember, a couple of weeks ago. And today we're going to move to the New Testament, and we're going to close uh, out our series in essential elements here, looking at uh, a widow that Jesus taught about in Luke chapter 18. And we'll be going in verses 1 through 18, and uh, it's going to culminate uh, with something that I think is, uh, well, it's a uh, it's kind of interesting because uh, as you examine the ministry of Jesus, a lot of times the parables that Jesus taught in, it, it's very obvious that he was uh, or he is a master storyteller. And so he would bring and draw in his audience and, uh, and until he got them to a place where he could kind of hook them. And then at the end of the parable, he springs it on them. And you can go back and examine the parables and you can see that. Uh, what's interesting is, is a lot of times, though, uh, people kind of went away from parables scratching their head, wondering what it was about. And the disciples, a little bit later on, uh, they would ask Jesus, what, it, what exactly did you mean by that? And uh, Jesus would press the meaning of that parable down into their heart. Uh, well, the parable today is a little bit different than that. Uh, in fact, in the beginning of this parable, as Jesus is speaking to his, to, uh, his disciples and those that are gathered around him, uh, he actually tells them, in the Gospel of Luke anyway, where this is recorded, uh, he tells them right up front what this parable is about, what it is that he's trying to illustrate. And uh, it actually is that first point uh, that, uh, that we looked at last week in uh, Faith Promise and the continuance of that, which is prayer. 
And uh, so you would think as you looked at this, and in fact, if you look in your Bibles, you'll find that most of the uh, most of Bibles today are broken up into sort of paragraphs, and uh, the uh, you know the publishers have put subject headings there. It's not necessarily a part of Scripture, uh, but it's just something to uh, label the uh, uh, divisions that uh, has been split up there in paragraphs. And it can be helpful sometimes, but in other other ways, uh, it's not that helpful. I know that uh, in Luke Luke chapter uh, 18, as we examine uh, that passage of Scripture, we find out that... uh, now, hang on here a second. Not only is my technology not cooperating before, it's not cooperating. Okay, now I'm back up with you now. Uh, but not only not only as Jesus spoke to them uh, about this parable, um, he gave them an understanding right up front, really, of what he was going to be pressed home. And it looks like as we move through this, that prayer winds up being the primary emphasis here. And in fact, the story does kind of uh, revolve around that, obviously because that's what's revealed in the beginning of it. But then in the very end of this paragraph, as we are going to be working our way through it, we find out that there is a hook that's thrown in in the end. And this hook actually goes back to chapter 17. We're not going to turn back there and look at it. Uh, But there is this prophetic element to the teaching that Jesus is giving. And it's brought out again in the emphasis that he pushes in the very last part of this uh, parable in verse 8. And we'll get to that as we go through this morning. Uh, in verse 1 he starts off, and this is that, uh, that thing that is uncharacteristic of parables that Jesus gives. He says he, will t- he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. And uh, he lays this definitive explanation out right in the beginning of this parable, primarily I think for us as we're reading it afterwards of course, that what you're going to be reading about is an illustration of how a person is supposed to persist in prayer. Now I don't know uh, because uh, I, I, don't, uh, I, d- I didn't ask the question and hadn't received a response for it, uh, how many of you have struggled over the years perhaps uh, to be persistent in your prayer life, uh, to be Uh, dogged in pursuing the things that you know that God wants. I think that there are some things that we are probably more persistent at than others. It was interesting on Wednesday night uh, in our Bible study there as I was uh, talking to uh, the people about Psalms chapter 28, we were actually looking at the idea uh, of uh, persisting in prayer. And I asked uh, the question of the people that there was 12 or 15 people there, "What, what have you been persistent in in prayers over the years about, and uh, if you were there on Wednesday night, don't answer this question, but what do you think was their answer? What do you think the answer that came out of that was, the the most common answer? Anybody want to venture a guess? All right. Okay, that's that's, uh, certainly one that people are concerned about, uh, but that wasn't the one that was most prominent. Anybody else want to venture a guess? It was a good guess. Health, okay, that's something that winds up being common in prayer request, and that certainly came out in our prayer time together, but that wasn't it. Money, that's another one that people care about, but that wasn't the most prominent one. Salvation for others. others. That actually, and it very much really wound up being in the group that I was talking to you, uh, guess who that salvation for others and spiritual concern was, was for, specifically? family, mostly their kids. And I, 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 think I found it interesting, and I, I think for myself even, uh, as I was uh, talking with people that uh, we were meeting that night, uh, that, that's something that I shared in common with them, is that uh, for, uh, you know, for my family, for my children especially, uh, and especially uh, for my son, I pray that God will work in his heart the things that are needed to draw him to him. And that is something that I think probably we have an affinity for that. Uh, We are able to be pretty consistent in our prayers for it. Uh, I know that for me, 
Nothing is more important uh, for me than uh, for my children uh, to serve God. That's something that's very high up on the priority list. For those of you who have kids, I know that probably you are echoing this sentiment. And especially as your kids get to be adults and they start somewhere along the way, somebody tells them that they can make decisions for themselves. And I don't know who it is that does that, but they're usually woefully unprepared to do that. And they start doing that. And as a parent, you're like, you're like, uh, uh, your teeth are clenched. And, and sometimes as you watch it, and then you, you have to remember back when you grew up, right? And you started making decisions. And now you have a sympathy for your parents that you never had before, right? Uh, but, you know, as we contemplated that, I, I thought about the idea of persistent prayer. There are some things that, that we seem to really uh, be able to key in more. It's probably the things that are closest to our heart, the things that are most prominent for us in our life. But, you know, as we examine this story this morning about the widow that uh, Jesus was speaking of there, uh, I want to share with you, uh, you know, some of the things that uh, Jesus wound up pressing home about this idea of persistent prayer. Uh, it was a prayer that cried out uh, for something even beyond the salvation, if you will, of others. It cried out for the relief of sin, the relief of the injustice, uh, the relief of all of the impact uh, that this world has felt because of the fall of mankind. And you know, it's, it's interesting as we examine this story that uh, Jesus would choose the subjects uh, or the examples or characters that he did uh, to tell this story. In fact, it causes some confusion among expositors. But let's begin this morning and, and continue on there uh, because verse 1 actually does tell us exactly what this is all about, how we ought to pray and how we ought not to lose heart. And then the second part, of, uh, the second verse, or as we go into the, uh, this passage, tells us that in a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. And I'm sure that all of those who were listening there had had experience with that type of judge. And it's interesting if you look at uh, the uh, uh, nation of Israel and you look at what God required of judges, uh, this would have been something that would have been precluded by God. In fact, uh, King Jehoshaphat at, at one, um, at one uh, time of the, uh, you know, at one time of the uh, history of Israel, uh, really laid out some uh, declarations for them, and this was something that even God uh, expounded upon in the law. But as we look at this particular judge that Jesus was highlighting, I'm sure that it resonated with everyone, uh, but what he was guilty of was this, uh, this dual uh, breaking of the greatest commandments that Jesus had given. You might recognize that if you move on and look at Matthew chapter 22 and verse 36. This was a judge who uh, really didn't have any fear of God, and he had no respect for mankind, which puts him in the category of pretty much caring only for himself and his interest. Matthew 22, Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, and he said, what he told the, those who asked the question, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So the two greatest commandments uh, were violated by this judge in the story that Jesus told. Uh, the things that were most important, in fact, the verse in, in Matthew goes on to say that all of this hangs, uh, the, the law and the prophets, all of it hang upon these two things. And this judge was uh, not, he, he just wasn't willing to abide by those things. So he was a very unrighteous judge. He was a very self-centered judge. He had his own interest only at heart. And I mentioned before to you uh, Jehoshaphat, and the requirement that he laid out when he appointed judges in the land. And that's in Second Chronicles chapter 19. It said he set judges in the land throughout the, all the fortified cities of Judah, city by city. And he said to the judges, take heed to what you're doing, for you do not judge for man, but for the Lord, who is with you in, ju in the judgment. Now, therefore, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take care and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, and no partiality nor taking of bribes. So as Jesus laid this story out, his audience would have been well aware not only of the fact that to love the Lord your God, to fear God, uh, and to love your neighbor as yourself, that these two greatest commandments were violated by this judge. And that also the specific admonitions included in Scripture about being a judge, that this judge just, he didn't, he didn't tick any of the boxes. 
Uh, he really was a man that, uh, that was out for what he could gain, obviously. And uh, this was the judge that Jesus laid before them in the story. He continued on and gives us the second character, character of the story as you move on. And it says there that there was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. Now, as we uh, spent some time two weeks ago talking about the, uh, the widow that was in the ministry of Elisha, I spent a little bit of time talking to you about the status of a widow uh, in uh, Bible times, that uh, although God had uh, laid out protection for them, uh, they really wound up many times being in a very disadvantaged position. In fact, in the story that we looked at in 2 Kings about Elisha and his ministry, you might remember the position that the widow there was in was that she was going to have to sell her sons to pay the debt that was left when her husband died. And Elisha stepped in and uh, through her willingness to enter into this faith arrangement provided for her. Uh, but you know, this was, this was kind of the condition of things uh, in Israel. Even though God precluded widows, uh, from being uh, taken advantage of and, and being persecuted, uh, it was still a place of uh, really great risk for them uh, when they lost their husbands. Uh, most of the time, uh, they married young. Life expectancy at that time was probably estimated somewhere in the uh, late 30s, early 40s. And uh, so, you know, as you look at that, they would have been fairly young by our estimates. And uh, they would have had uh, maybe a lot of life in front of them, but uh, not a lot of hope for that life. And uh, this widow, what she had as far as recourse in her life was to appeal to a judge. Evidently, someone was violating the commandments of God, taking advantage of her, putting her in even a more disadvantaged position than she was. And so she took this to the judge. And he would have been gathered probably around the, around the city gates, that's many times, uh, where the witnesses gathered together and where issues were taken. Uh, but this woman, it says, uh, she kept coming uh, to the judge. She kept coming. And uh, we're going to find out as we go into this that uh, that was something that sort of defined her character. Uh, in Exodus chapter 22, I mentioned to you that God precluded widows uh, from being disadvantaged in their circumstances. And he said, you shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If you afflict them in any way and they cry at all to me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath will become hot, and I will kill you with the sword. Your wife shall be widows and your children fatherless. So you can understand in this admonition that God gave uh, to Israel, and then specifically applying it to this judge, you remember the very first thing that was said about this judge? That he didn't do what? Fear God, right? Well, obviously, God had specifically addressed these kind of circumstances, and this judge just really didn't believe it. Uh, he didn't care about what was taking place in this widow woman's life. Now, her response to his lack of willingness to enter into her circumstance and intervene is kind of interesting. Uh, it says that uh, in our text that for a while, he was unwilling. He didn't want to enter into her circumstance. He didn't want to intervene. He didn't want to interdict in the injustice that she was experiencing. Uh, but it says afterward, he said to himself, even though <coughs> I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. And uh, it, it's really almost in a sense kind of humorous. Uh, it's an interesting uh, contradiction of sorts that even though a widow was very disadvantaged, uh, she would have had um, almost kind of a pass to bother this judge in a way that uh, if it was a man that would have bothered him in the way that she probably was, as described in the text, uh, it would have been handled differently. But because she was a widow, there was almost an external social pressure uh, to, you know, not uh, maybe, you know, he didn't want to acknowledge her, uh, but on the other hand, too, it, 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 he didn't want to publicly, uh, didn't want to publicly do anything to push her away or, uh, you know, make himself look bad in front of everyone else. And uh, even though he obviously uh, was known as a man who did not fear God or care about other people. But what we do find out is that in his self-centeredness, he did care about being bothered over and over and over again. And um, 
I can't help but think, uh, when I think about this, uh, I guess what comes to my mind uh, more than anything is I, I remember, um, well, I don't remember so much my kids doing it, but I remember my mom telling me that I did it. Uh, she used to, um, as her relief from uh, the, oh, I don't know, the, the pressures of momhood, I guess, uh, she used to play the piano. And uh, she has told me time and time again, stories over and over again, how when she played the piano, I would come up to her. I was the, the first kid, and so, of course, I got blamed for everything. But uh, anyway, I would come up for her, and I would tug on her while she was playing the piano and say, Mama, 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 over and over and over again to try to get her to pay attention to me and give me what I wanted when I was a kid. And uh, I'm sure it was in a very polite way, but she said I was very persistent and uh, uh, she told me stories about uh, the aggravation that I had uh, that uh, and also the the deviation away from good things when she didn't give me the attention that I wanted that it kind of escalated and I, I think in in some sense we kind of recognize that uh, that pattern there but as we look at this story what we find is a widow woman who because of the cultural things that uh, surrounded her life she had the opportunity, and in fact, the text, as you look at it, it actually communicates this. Uh, you know, it says he was unwilling for a while, but she says she's actually going to continually wear me out. The words that are used there convey the idea of like blackening someone's eye. And so this woman was really, she was really into uh, harassing this judge. And in our modern day time, you know, you might look at it like this. Maybe the story went something like she, she managed to get his cell phone number and she was calling him at home. Now, in our world, of course, we'd had a, she'd had a restraining order out on her. But, uh, you know, he managed, she managed to get her cell phone number. She found out where his address was and she carried a placard around out front and protested in front of his house. And uh, he would go out to eat lunch and lo and behold, there she'd pop in and she'd want to be set at a table over by him. And then she'd lean over and say, hey, I need you to do, you know, I mean, you can just imagine uh, that in our culture, the kind of harassment, and that's really what is being conveyed in this, that she persistently uh, pursued this judge for the things that she wanted to have happen. And the story is kind of interesting. I'm sure that Jesus had everyone's attention, and probably most of them were thinking to themselves, well, that judge just deserved it. And I know how persistent she probably was because, uh, my, you know, I mean, you can just imagine the conversations going on in people's head as Jesus laid this out. So he had everybody's attention. He was drawing them all in on the story. And then he finishes it up. He, you know, the unrighteous judge says, well, I'm just going to go ahead and do this. And the Lord said this. He said, hear what the unjust, unrighteous judge said, uh, said now. Will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. And so, you know, like most parables, uh, the characters in the story wound up being representative uh, of someone. And in this particular instance, we almost feel a little bit reluctant to apply to, you know, the unrighteous judge to saying, well, that would be, I mean, if you look at it, that would be God. And so you kind of begin to wonder, is that, and is the, is the persistent widow woman, is, is that would be us in our prayers and persisting in that. And it kind of casts maybe an unfavorable light on what's taking place there. But that's not really the purpose or the point of all of this. Uh, in fact, I think that what's really being emphasized there is the contrast between those. Uh, Jesus was really uh, emphasizing the persistence of the widow woman in her persisting over and over again and doggedly pursuing the things that she's wanting. And he also emphasizes this unrighteous judge who had no interest whatsoever in her, her uh, quality of life or the things that concerned her. And yet, because of the way this equation was put together, there was a response. And so as Jesus lays this before, or lays this before everyone, uh, it is, a, uh, it is a, 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 well, there's actually a Latin word for it, but I'm not even going to give it to you because, number one, I can't remember it, and number two, you probably wouldn't either. But uh, there's a Latin word for this approach to teaching, and it says if, this would, if they would do this, then how much more, and it's a Latin word that basically means how much more, how much more would God 
do what uh, he would do. And in this situation, you can look at it and you can say, well, God is not unrighteous. God doesn't just care for himself. Uh, and uh, I, I, don't, uh, I don't think that I'm, um, you know, trying to give God a black eye in persistence in my prayer. Uh, the contrast that is there is this widow woman, she had no position or right really in one sense. There was no benefit for this judge to help this woman other than just being fearful of God and wanting to be obedient. But we as God's in, in, children, in contrast to her, we have the privilege and God, the God declared and God given right to approach God. And we know that scripture teaches us that God wants to honor our request, that God, uh, he enjoys giving good things to his children. And that God is a benevolent and a giving God, that he enjoys uh, being able to do that. And so, you know, the how much more would God, so you can see that contrast that's laid out in the story. And that's the way that uh, God would, uh, or that Jesus would have laid that out there in teaching them. In this, in this portion of our text right there, it says that, he says, you hear about what the righteous judge said, uh, and he said, now... Um, or, uh, now, or what the righteous judge said now, and he said, will not God bring about justice for his elect who cries to him day and night, and will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring justice for them quickly. And, you know, it's an interesting thing as we look at that passage of Scripture that we know that there are some of God's uh, children that, uh, well, they died not getting justice. They died not receiving the things in this world that God uh, you know, that, that they knew that God had for them. Uh, so you kind of look at this and you begin to wonder, well, what is it that he's exactly speaking about? And I think as I examine that uh, passage, I like the uh, rendering that the King James Version and the New King James, uh, they, that they, the way they render that passage where it says, will he delay long over them? The word that is used there is macrothumos, and it's a word that's sometimes translated long-suffering or patience. And I, I think that sometimes as we start looking at pronouns, we begin to apply them in a certain way. And as we look at this, uh, we wonder, and, and I think the translators actually translated it in this way, thinking that the delay, or how long will he delay over them, that was referring to God's children. But I don't think that's really what's being referred here. I think that the long suffering and the macrothumos, that Greek word that is there, I think that it applies to those that are not complying and those that are not God's children, in fact. Uh, and as we examine that, he says, I tell you, I will bring about justice for them quickly that we're not talking about, uh, we're not talking about uh, really a calendar timing here, that it's going to happen tomorrow so much as we are that it's going to happen in a very sudden fashion. I think this is what's communicated more accurately. And in fact, if you turn over to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 through 10, you begin to see some of that uh, really played out in the way that Peter explained uh, this reference here. He says, or not, this, not the passage we're looking at, but uh, the concept that I'm talking to you about. He said, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient, and that's the word microthumos there, toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. And so we see here that God delays. Uh, God delays why? Because he is a loving God, and because he understands that uh, those that would come to repentance, sometimes it requires some time. Uh, there's an operative value in that. And then also we see here that he talks about the day of the Lord coming like a thief with suddenness, a surprise, if you will. And I believe that that kind of conveys more accurately. Uh, sometimes the translations don't, don't really communicate it in a way that gives it clarity. But I think it kind of communicates uh, in this passage in Second Peter uh, the things that Jesus was actually speaking about there. And what's interesting about that many times, and I, I think about this, uh, is that uh, it, it's, it's like a double-edged sword with God, is that uh, sometimes, sometimes as we examine the timing of the Lord and we want relief from something that we're in, what's actually happened in our circumstances is that God is extending his macrothumia, uh, his long-suffering and his patience towards someone else. We want relief 
And on the one hand, we're looking at it and we're thinking, how long will God tarry? And you read some of the Psalms and you see this. And what we find out is that many times we're stuck in a position, if you will, of waiting for justice to come because of the long suffering of God for others. When we look at the second coming of the Lord, and I told you that this had kind of a prophetic uh, apocalyptic flavor to it from uh, Luke chapter 17, you find out uh, that this in, in essence really is, uh, really is what we're looking at as far as waiting for the Lord. God is waiting for that last person. Uh, who is going to come to know him. He's waiting for that last soul to redeem. And he is long suffering in this. And he has waited and he has waited and waited so that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. But the flip side of that for us is, is that we have to wait. He, we have to wait also. We're in that position where, uh, where sometimes we endure more suffering. We endure more passage of time in the things that we are doing. And, uh, you know, I think this is probably an equation that uh, is, is very obvious uh, in the, the relationship of parenting, you know, where when you're trying to, uh, perhaps you're trying to teach your children something, and you know as you have them engage in doing it, maybe you're teaching them how to help you, that number one, you're probably going to have to do it over. They're not going to do it well, and they're going to be slower than Christmas as they try to figure it out because they're learning, Right. Uh, they're trying to arrive at a position where they can be proficient at it. But what that means in the interim is that you have to be patient, that you have to accept that uh, getting the job done isn't going to be, you know, that's not going to be the most important thing here. Uh, if the job, if, if the most important thing is to just to accomplish the task, then you just do it yourself, right? And so, you know, it kind of mirrors that in one sense as I think about it. But as Jesus spoke to his disciples, uh, he began to hone in on something that is a part of that equation. And he said that while you're in the midst as a believer of waiting for the things that I am doing, uh, he says, I want you to participate in this. And the way that you participate, and I shared it with you last week, uh, I, I, you know, I can't remember whether I shared it with you last week or whether I shared it on Wednesday night, but uh, they start running together sometimes. But I explained that uh, when we are put in a position of waiting, it is an invitation by God for us to pray. It's an invitation for us to enter into uh, his work and what he is doing. And many times we look at waiting as something very passive, but God says it needs to be active. You need to be persistent in your prayers. You need to engage in uh, what it is that what it is that you are pursuing after me? Is it within my will? And during this interim of time, it's a beautiful thing that happens is, is that uh, I was uh, reading, it was a quote by Puritan, I didn't include it in here, but uh, it was an interesting thing. And he said that, uh, that uh, praying was uh, kind of like being offshore with a ship. Uh, and uh, when you pray, he says, we don't, we don't pull the land closer to us. Uh, he says, we actually wind up going to the land. And uh, what he really used that as analogous to is the relationship with how God deals with our heart as we enter into actively participating in what he's doing and waiting, is that he begins to change and align us with his will. And when we fail to persist in prayer, and I can just even tell you this, and if you want to liken it, bring it down to something that's very relatable, and thinking about your kids, you know, I mean, at first, at first it's the, the prayer is like, oh my gosh, God, please uh, just uh, save them, save them. And, uh, you know, you, you pray that way for a while, and you say, oh God, uh, you begin to, you begin to uh, enter into the equation a little bit more heavier, and, uh, or a little more heavily. And you say, uh, God, you know, just... Uh, uh, just work the things in their life that are needed for their salvation or, or for you to, them to return to you. Uh, oh, God, bring someone into their life that can influence them in this. And uh, you kinda, you're kind of you still walking down the road a little bit. And then very, with much trepidation, you begin to, you begin to say, Oh, God, um, I, I know that uh, whatever it takes to bring them to you, I know you'll do that. But but only what it takes, God, not any more than that. And you, you can kind of see it's beginning to amp up just a little bit. And then pretty soon you get to that place where I don't know what it's going to take, God, but whatever it takes, you need to do that in their life for them. Please, Father, just bring them to you. And you can kind of begin to see it ramping up there. 
And you, you really, what, what's occurring there isn't necessarily just a reflection of your desperation for this. It really is in alignment with God's will because this is what God says. Listen, I have a vested interest in accomplishing this and I will do what is necessary to get the job done. I, I will do that. And so really in all honesty, even though we approach it with a great deal of trepidation, we begin in our prayers in the perseverance of that we began to see that kind of align with God's plan and, uh, and really God's pattern of dealing with us. I find it interesting uh, to give consideration to those uh, dynamics in this. Uh, Second Peter chapter 3 tells us that there is a double-edged sword uh, in the equation. In verse, uh, in the, the verse continues, and this is that last hook that I was telling you about that Jesus throws in, which really kind of ties in. We've been talking about this with Faith Promise. I shared with you that start off by praying, but these are not just uh, in, in sequence, uh, you know, the things that I, that I shared with you to do, uh, uh, to pray and then to commit and then watch and then give. Uh, it isn't just a sequence. There's a continuation of those things. It's the same thing. Uh, and, and I want to encourage you, uh, as we embark upon doing the things that we do as a church to enter into the equation with God. Uh, as he delays his coming, uh, intensify your desire and persist in your prayers that God's will will be accomplished here in Thurston County for us as we try to reach uh, the people who don't know Jesus. And uh, here in, in this country, the uh, mission efforts that we participate in and, and then across in far places like uh, we've seen video from Thailand and from Romania, enter into the equation uh, with God. And then with regard to your giving, uh, the same thing. Let there be intensity in it. Let the desire build and uh, let it uh, be used of God to align with you. But, you know, this idea of persistence in prayer is declared in the beginning as the purpose of this parable. And it certainly is explained. But then Jesus gets all the way to the end of it. And he says this, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And you're like, what in the world? Where did he, where did he get that? I mean, why did he go there? Uh, you know, it seems like almost like a, we've been talking about prayer, and then all of a sudden he, he, he kind of does a, a left turn there. Uh, but I told you that I think some of this ties back to chapter 17, and it really is an unfortunate chapter break there uh, that, you know, that's a man-made a um, man-made invention for our convenience there. Uh, but uh, I think it goes back to some of that apocalyptic language and about the second uh, coming of Jesus Christ. And he asks this question, and he says this. He says, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? And, and I think that tying these two things together is very, very, very important. And it is this, is that as Jesus spoke and taught about the persistence of prayer, Probably one of the primary reasons we don't persist in prayer is because we, we don't believe that it's going to happen. We, we stop trusting that God can accomplish what he says he's going to accomplish. And I think some have taught that, hey, once you ask God for something, you've asked him and he knows all about what you need, so don't be bothering him again. And, you know, I'm not telling you to try to give God a black eye like this widow was as she was hammering on this judge. Uh, I, don't think that, I don't think that our objective as a believer should be to wear God down in an area, you know. I don't think we have to do that, in fact. Uh, but what I do see in this is that many times uh, we abandon our persistence in prayer uh, because we really lose uh, that fervor and intensity of belief that we can trust God to do what he says he will do. And, you know, we begin to get all theological on God and say, well, you know, I just, I know that people get to make their own choices. And, you know, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if they're going to make the right choice or not. And, and so we, we kind of flag in our efforts. We get tired and I think we get fatigued in that. Uh, that's something that I've noticed with uh, uh, COVID. I think people are very, very fatigued with some of the limitations and the restrictions that have gone along with this. I, I can see it in people's faces. I hear it in the things that they're saying. And I've experienced it some 
uh, myself also. And, and I think that uh, even like in those kind of circumstances, sometimes we get fatigued. And Jesus looked at the disciples and he said, he said, well, the son of man find faith. He says, are there going to be people who are still persisting in praying for my return and for my will to be done on earth as it is in heaven? Are there still going to be people who are believing that I will come and that I will accomplish the things that I have said? And, you know, all of this winds up being tied uh, to persistence uh, in our prayers. I think as we examine that, uh, however it says when the Son of Man find, uh, comes, will he find faith on the earth? I think it's important that we make personal application of this in our own life. You know, will, will I be persistent in believing that God is God and that God can do the things that I ask of him and believe and trust asking in faith? Uh, but then it goes even beyond that to the idea of is that something that can be communicated, if you will, to those who come after me. Uh, I was listening to uh, a sermon. Uh, uh, it was actually by a guy named Albert Moeller. He's uh, on, on this particular passage, and it was interesting listening to him. He was uh, speaking at, it was a, uh, he was speaking at a, a chapel uh, at a, um, I think it was uh, South, uh, Southwestern University. Uh, it's a uh, Southwestern Seminary speaking to the student body there and he was talking about growing up uh, a southern baptist and he was talking about how how the uh when he was growing up in the uh, in the 60s and the 70s how they had a program from cradle to grave uh to influence people uh for the kingdom of god and he said uh, uh and i was thinking about my own childhood and i was relating to it as he was talking i was thinking about getting up on sunday morning and i had Sunday school, and then after Sunday school, we had preaching services, and then we went home and we ate and took a nap. That was the Sunday routine for us, uh, and I hated the nap part, but now I love the nap part. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, and then at 6 o'clock, we went back to church, and we had what was called BTC, uh, and uh, BTC is Baptist Training Course, and that's where you basically had Sunday school again, and then after that you had preaching services again, uh, and then uh, on Wednesday night we had uh, another uh, another time of, of teaching, and I was thinking about the number of hours, and he was saying in his uh, youth growing up that he spent between 9 and 13 hours a week at, at church. And uh, I was thinking to myself as I was listening to that, that that probably approximated what, what I did. And he really pressed hard to this student body he was talking about them. He said, look at the time that we live in. He said, there is a hostility towards spiritual things, especially towards Christianity. And he says, what is it that makes us think that when it is a harder time for our kids to grow up, that less and less is going to accomplish more and more. That somehow in doing less, we're going to reinforce and produce people who are committed to being the kind of person where faith would exist when Jesus comes. He says, will I be able to find someone who has faith, someone who's practicing what they say that they believe? And we have to be concerned about that, not only an application to ourselves, but an application to those who come after us, whether it's our children or whether it's those whom we're seeing discipled in our church or, or through ministry. And he said, less and less does not produce more and better. And yet we're in a time where things are more desperate. And he spoke about, you know, I don't know if I would go so far as to say in in American culture that we're persecuted, but we at least have to deal with, you know, the disapproval. And we don't always do that very well. But in our culture, it seems like that is enough for us to feel like we're persecuted. When someone disapproves of us, it keeps us from practicing our faith, from persevering in it. And Jesus said, listen, this is a rhetorical question. Will I find any faith? When I come, and I believe certainly rhetorical questions beg an answer. <laughs> it's funny, over the years, I remember when I was growing up as a kid, there were always people in the churches my dad pastored that didn't know what a rhetorical question was. 
He'd ask the question and they've answered, they would answer it. We, we've had a few here at Sunbreak and frankly, you know, in some senses, I, it's sort of refreshing, you know. Uh, it's a little bit of feedback once in a while, but uh, Jesus was asking a question and it, it was a rhetorical question of sorts. Will I find any faith? And I'm thinking back about Matthew chapter 18, about what Jesus said. He said, so he was speaking to uh, Peter, but I think he was speaking about himself. He says, upon this rock, he said, I will build my church. And he said, hell will not prevail against it, against the gates of the church. Is that an accurate rendition of that passage? It didn't, is it? It says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church he's building. And what it implies, I think, as I reword it, it becomes a little bit clearer, is that God doesn't intend for us to be an enclave uh, with gates that keeps everything out that shouldn't be in. He intends for us to be on the go, assaulting the gates of hell, uh, you know, with the water, proverbial water pistol, right? Uh, that there are people who are perishing. And, you know, so as we spend our time together in faith promise, as we talk about this, I think it's very important that we understand that we are waiting for a purpose, and we need to actively wait, both by persevering in our prayer and by entering into kingdom work, by allowing God to do through us what he might not do to us, right? And that that faith that can be communicated, and I'll run out of time to even talk about it, but in Philemon, the Apostle Paul talked about it in verse 6, he talked about a faith that was communicated, I like the, the word that the King James uses there. And a faith that is communicated is not a faith that is fixated on what we can see. It's not a faith that's fixated or has an affinity for what we can do ourselves. Uh, and it's not a faith that says that I'm more interested in what I can consume than what I can give. And this is, this is a faith that can be communicated when it is practiced before those who uh, are watching, on, looking on. And this is the kind of faith, I think, that will cause Jesus, when he comes back, to say, you can answer that rhetorical question for me now. There are still people here who love my appearing, who have labored, who have loved, and who have not waited passively that they've believed that I am who I say I am and that I need to accomplish in your life and through your life uh, what I will. This is, this is God's plan. It's the privilege that we have being a part of it. So I would encourage you to consider that as you think about whether or not God is leading you to participate in faith promise giving. It's not for everyone, okay? We talked about that last week. But if God is moving your heart, then do it joyfully, cheerfully, and enter into it believing that God can do what we cannot do, that God can do what I can't see, and that God will give through me what he might not give to me because I'm not interested in what I consume as much as I am in what I can contribute. That's faith promise in a nutshell. We're going to finish up, and I want to just ask you to ponder a question in your heart as we finish up and uh, may God direct you in the path that you would go. Thank you, Bobby. So Bobby went over, uh, went over this week the widow, the widow that needed legal support, and he started off with that question uh, that he asked last Wednesday, uh, how many of you have been persistent in your prayers? And that question actually stemmed out of another question. It was uh, stemmed out of what are you the most scared of? And I was most scared of bugs. Um, <laughs> and my wife told everyone that. Uh, but this widow that needed support, she was persistent in asking the judge uh, for legal support, she was badgering the judge. And Luke chapter 18, verses 7 and 8 said, 
Will not God grant justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay helping him? I tell you that he will swiftly grant them justice. Never, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, uh, will he find faith on earth? And then Bobby con contrasted between our relationship with God and with the woman and the judge. And when I read that story, I kind of feel like that woman. I kind of feel like the badgering woman where I'm uh, constantly asking God for more and for more and constantly asking him for the same thing. But the Bible says in 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, the Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. You see, our persistent prayer aligns us with God's will, and God's timing is perfect. Now today, for your consideration, the question is, the real question is not whether God will do what he has promised to do, the real question is whether we will trust him to do it. So today on your way home, if you guys could talk about that, discuss that with your family, uh, I think it's a valid question. Uh, what, are, what is our real question? Uh, and I think the real question is whether we will trust him to do what he has promised to do. Well, today, uh, after second service at 1215, we have our 201 maturity class where you get to learn to uh, walk and look more like Jesus. Uh, it's a great class. Uh, Brad still has seats available. Uh, tell someone here if you would like to be a part of the 201 class today. It'll be in the journey room in the back around 1215. Uh, tonight, 5 p.m., there is a stewardship meeting. Uh, so be here. 5 p.m. There'll also be a Zoom link. If you need the Zoom link, uh, ask, ask one of us. We can send you the Zoom link for tonight. Uh, and uh, on all of your seats, you see the Faith Promise cards. The Faith Promise cards. If you wish to be a part of the Faith Promise, uh, you can go ahead and fill out that card and put it into one of the uh, little black boxes on the wall in the, on the back of the sanctuary there. That would be fantastic. I wanted to thank everybody for uh, coming today and worshiping with us, and I'd like to pray if I could. Uh, dear Lord, most gracious Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to come and gather and to worship you and to learn more about you, Father. Thank you for the message today. Uh, please help us to be persistent in prayer. Please help to align us with your will through our persistent prayer, Father. We know that your timing is perfect. We know that you love us. and. Uh, that you have our best interest in mind. Uh, thank you so much, Father. Thank you for everything you've given us. Thank you for your love. Uh, thank you. In Jesus' most precious name I pray, amen.